Um, Mark chapter 4, verse 35. Excellent. Uh, Jesus comes to Psalm. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Keep going. Yeah. Yep, so the healing of a demon-possessed man. They went across the lake to the region of the uh, Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send him out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, Send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off to report this into the town and countryside, and along the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to play with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting out into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. Yes. Let me pray and uh, then we'll think about that passage together. Heavenly Father, won't you help us now think clearly about the world we live in, the lives we live. And please, by the power of your Holy Spirit, why don't you help us find our hope and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray this in his name and for your glory. Amen. Uh, we live in a dangerous world. Have you worked that out yet? Uh, and we have dangerous lives. Or is that just me? Am I just too morbid? Uh, it's the week before Christmas. The last thing you want to be thinking about is danger. Dangerous world, dangerous lives. You just want to celebrate, right? You want this, it's so close to the end of the year, you want this year to be over and done with, and you can start a new year with great joy and anticipation that next year will be so much better than the year that was. Who has that kind of hope and expectation and dream and desire and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's just, that's just a sign of madness, right? Because the world we live in is dangerous and the lives we live are dangerous. And the dangers uh, that kind of 
pressure in against us are real. There are the destructive forces of nature. They exist. They are real. Earthquakes, storms, fires. Certainly, over the last number of years, we've, it's been heightened. Our attention to the climate has been heightened beyond anything else. We are living in troubled times. And if we don't make some changes very quickly, we're going to just wipe ourselves out. It's kind of the doomsday theory, right? But I'm not knocking that. I'm just saying, if you live in a country, if you live in any country in the world, you've got to watch out for nature. You've got to watch out for the sea, the wind, and the sun. Yeah? No one goes out into the sun these days, in the middle of the day, without putting on a little bit of protection, right? Because now we're smart. The UV rays will literally kill you. Not immediately, over time. But you get the idea, right? If you live in Queensland, and if you've been in northern part of Queensland just recently, what has been on your news every single day of the week? It's been on our news too, really, on the weather. Cyclone who? Jazz bar. You see, you know it. You know the danger. It's just not come home to roost because we're in Sydney, right? And we don't get that kind of danger. We've got other kinds of danger. But we are smart, right? Because we live in a society now that has learned to learned the idea of risk mitigation. That's a new word that I've discovered that's coming across my desk all the time now. Risk mitigation. Risk mitigation with children. Risk mitigation with church buildings. Risk mitigation with everything and everyone. But particularly the notion of risk mitigation when it comes to the risks that nature propose, uh, uh, brings us is very good. We have satellites in the sky now, right? And weather bureaus that can tell us exactly what's going to happen almost to 100% of what's going to happen in the next week, what's going to happen in the next few days, what's going to happen in the next few hours. It's brilliant. Gives us a real sense of security, doesn't it? The risk mitigation that goes on when there's a tidal wave, when there's a cyclone, when there's an earthquake, when they're floods or fires, it's almost puts us into a false sense of we got this. It's not dangerous at all. Tell that to the people who lose their homes and lose their lives and family members due to the destructive forces of nature. There's another danger that's lurking, but I hesitate to talk about this danger because you're going to laugh at me. It's the danger of demonic forces. Ooh. The danger of demonic forces. Who believes in the danger of demonic forces working in the world? You are from the Stone Age. The enlightenment and reason has taught us that spiritual realm is voodoo stuff. It doesn't actually exist.
the danger of the demonic forces. The only place you and I see demonic forces operating now today is in the movies. Did you know that? There's a new movie out. Well, I don't know if it's new. Russell Crowe's in it. Have you seen it? Russell Crowe is the exorcist for the Pope. It's actually based on true stories. That there was this father who went around exercising evil spirits. And Russell Crowe acts in the movie as the main guy that goes around doing this. I watched it the other night. Confess, I watched the first five minutes. And then I just turned it off. I was like, no, no, I don't want to be confronted with this. I don't want to watch this. This is bad, bad news. Can we just leave it in the movies? I wonder if you're aware of the danger of demonic forces working in our world. There is danger in our world, not because of only the destructive forces of nature, not only because of the destructive demonic forces, but also because of the destructive force of disease and death. But we don't like thinking about disease and death, do we? And isn't it wonderful how the Enlightenment and how the introduction of science has brought us so many remarkable benefits when it comes to disease. Life expectancy in Australia is now what? Who knows the number? Yeah, I think it's around about 85. For indigenous folks, it's a little lower, and that's a tragedy, and we're working on that. But 85, no matter what is going on in the world, you have now, if you live in this country in Australia, you have a life expectancy of 85. I was just thinking about that the other day, of what I turned on Friday, 57. And I thought, 85. I've got two feet that are really sore. And I'm like, 85? <laughs> really? 85 are sore feet. My big toe. I went to the doctor with my big toe. I thought I got gout. She said, stop the drinking and the smoking. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> You don't get gout just from those things. But anyway, uh, she says to me, I don't have gout. I'm like, are you sure? Can we run some blood tests? I never go to the doctor. But even as I speak to you right now, my big right toe is throbbing and paining. 85. There must be a cure. Gabby, stop it. She's going to lose it. I'm making light of it, aren't I? But we've come a far way when people are diagnosed with sickness and disease. We've come a remarkable far way in finding healing and restoration for people. Haven't we? It's remarkable. But it's not perfect. Disease brings with it, sickness brings with it, danger. 
and danger of death. But don't worry about death. Because death is not such a big deal, is it? Because we all have to endure it sooner or later. And in actual fact, now death is not such a big deal that you could actually plan your own death. In New South Wales, we now have laws that if you're tired of life, if you've had enough, if you have a very sore right toe and the suffering's unbearable, you can have assisted euthanasia. Because death is not such a big deal. You can plan the way you leave. And you can leave with a sense of dignity and without any sense of pain or suffering. And don't worry about those you leave behind. Because when it comes to thinking about your life, when you've moved on, we have a remedy for that as well. There's no need for anybody to be sad. Because we run funeral services now where we celebrate people's lives. You don't have to be sad about death. We live in dangerous times. The destructive forces of nature cannot be controlled by us. The destructive demonic forces cannot be controlled by us. And no matter how much we try, and no matter how much we advance in science, we cannot completely get rid of the destructive force of disease and death. Is there anybody that can help us? Is there anybody that can rescue us from the destructive forces of nature, demonic forces, disease and death? In Mark chapter 4, Mark records four miracles of Jesus and he clusters them together. And we only read two of them for you this morning. The first one is Jesus calming a storm. The second is Jesus driving out a whole legion of demons into pigs. The third story is about a woman that wasn't read, and I encourage you to go read it in chapter 5 to the end of chapter 5, is about a woman with a disease that meant she's been bleeding for over 12 years. She's been to every kind of doctor. No one can help her. And she comes up to Jesus and touches him in the crowd, and she's immediately healed. And while Jesus is making his way in the crowd. There's a man that comes to him and says to him, my daughter is really very ill. Will you please come and heal her? Jairus' daughter. And Jesus says, yes, he will come and heal her. And while he's making his way towards the man's house, this incident with this woman happens and he stops and he engages with the woman. And during that period of time, people come from Jairus' home to tell him, don't bother Jesus anymore, your daughter has died. And Jesus goes to Jairus' home. And there he sees the wailing women, professionals who are crying over the fact that this child has died. And Jesus goes into the room and he takes the little girl's hand and he tells her to get up as if she was asleep. 
and she gets up. Mark recalls four miracles that Jesus performs and he clumps them all together. And the reason he does that is because he has an answer to the dangerous lives we live, all humans live. There is one who has authority over nature. There is one who has authority over demons. There is one who has authority over disease. And there is one who has authority over death. And his name is Jesus. Isn't that crazy? That's why Mark puts these four stories together. So that you might know there is help. There is a rescuer. Because here's what happens in the world that you and I live in, this dangerous world. We are hit by nature and the devastation nature causes. We're not so much affected by demonic forces. I get that. But we are affected by disease. And we are affected by death. We live with those horrible, horrible, dangerous forces at work in our lives and when those forces come home to roost in our lives we need help and what do we do we cry out for help we cry out to a God for help and you know what happens nothing And because nothing happens, we think God is either not there, or we think if God is there, he's neither loving nor powerful. We think God is a loving God, but he's just not powerful enough to rescue us from the danger. Or... We think God is powerful enough to rescue us from danger, but he's just not loving enough to do it. And so there's so many people in the world, when faced with real danger, give up on God and say they are all alone and only they can help themselves. Mark records these four miracles to say to all of humanity that God is real, that God is both powerful and loving, and he demonstrates it by sending his son into the world and demonstrates that Jesus has power and authority over nature, over demons, over disease, over death. At the end of the story that we read about the coming of the storm, this is what the disciples say. Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. And Jesus' response to his disciples is to say, Why are you so afraid? Do you still not have faith? I don't know what you're going through right now. I don't know what the danger looks like for you. But I tell you these events that took place 2,000 years ago. And I say to you, do not be afraid. Put your faith in Jesus. 
for he is both powerful and loving. And God sent him into this world, this dangerous world, to rescue you and me. Merry Christmas. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to stand and sing a song together, and then we're going to share in the Lord's table together. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your Son. Thank you that he demonstrates that you are both loving and powerful. Thank you that you sent him into this world to rescue us from this dangerous world and the dangerous life that we live. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.